Good morning, and welcome to another episode of Legislative Matters Now with m and I'm Morgan Spicer, Special Projects Coordinator with the ARC of the Mid-Ohio Valley. Now, before we start, I'd like to talk about the purpose of the show. The purpose of our show here is to educate you, the self-advocate, on the important topic of legislative advocacy. Now, every month, we discuss a piece of legislation that applies to self-advocates and help you understand the topic and why it's so important. We also, when time allows, speak to a self-advocate in our Advocate in Action segment as they talk about how they are using their self-advocacy skills to benefit their lives or the lives around them in their community. We also have a guest speak on the topic of legislative advocacy. We hope by doing this that you will better understand that topic so it's less complicated. This month's guest will be joining us in just a few moments, but let's get the show underway with Who You Gonna Call. Today on Who You Gonna Call, a person can become a West Virginia lawmaker without being elected. How does that happen? A, you can call your city council member to find out how. B, your state house of delegate or state senator. C, your state senator or U.S. Congress member. Or D, a state agency that specializes in what you want to know. So what do you think, Morgan? I think it's B. B, your state house of delegate or state senator. Let's yes. find out. Are you sure that's your final answer? Final answer. Your state house of delegate or state senator. The West Virginia House of Delegates is composed of 100 members from 67 delegate districts throughout the state. Delegates serve two-year terms with all of the seats in the House up for election every two years. Representing 17 senatorial districts, the Senate is comprised of 34 members. Senators serve four-year terms with half of those seats up for election every two years. However, Sometimes things happen and a delegate or a senator leaves office before the end of their term. It could be a job change, state lawmakers have passed away, or there could be other reasons. In that case, a delegate or state senator gets appointed to fill in until the next regular election and can run for that office if they want to see if they get elected to serve the next complete term. Melissa and I had the opportunity to speak to a member of the House of Delegates who experienced the same situation of being appointed first. Let's get to that interview now. Today's guest is Trenton Barnhart. Trenton is a community banker as well as the Assistant Majority Whip for the West Virginia House of Delegates. He is on several committees including House Banking and Insurance and Workforce Development Committee. Thanks so much for joining us today and welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be down here at the Ark of the Mid-Ohio Valley. Uh, they do so many wonderful things in the community and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions today. All right, let's get this started, Melissa. So, Delegate Barnhart, how did you first decide you wanted to run for office? What is the process? Well, so for me, I actually got appointed back in 2019. Uh, Delegate Harshbarger had resigned to take another position. And uh, so what I ended up doing was I got, I, I applied for the position through the Delegate Executive Committee. And then I was, and then I was actually uh, nominated to Governor Justice. And the governor selected me back in 2019. And then in 2020, I decided I wanted to run for office and uh, run for a full term in the House of Delegates. And uh, whenever I did that, uh, I tell you, the biggest focus for me was accessibility and transparency. I think it's important that people are able to get a hold of their legislator and be able to discuss issues and also air grievances. So that's why, you know, I, I, I consider myself to be one of the most accessible, accessible delegates in the legislature because everybody can find my telephone number and I'm always happy to take calls from constituents. How do you learn about different, top, different topics relating to the legislation? Well, that's a good question. You know, everybody, every member of the legislature has a different background. You know, for me, my background is community banking. So, you know, finance, marketing, those types of things. But the biggest thing that I, I always stress with, with everybody is we can't, be, uh, we can't be an expert on everything. 
you know, and for that we have to rely on, you know, folks who are in the industry and in the business and, uh, you know, like for example, when we're talking about education issues, I'm probably going to talk to a school teacher. When we're dealing with issues dealing with oil and gas, I'm going to want to talk to somebody who's a royalty owner, a mineral owner, or, or maybe a, uh, or somebody in the oil and gas industry. You know, I want to make sure that we're talking to the people who are in the field every day. That's how we best learn about it because they're the ones dealing with the issues, dealing with that particular area of, of policy every single day and we, we try to hear from the experts. So Delegate Barnhart, what would be the best way for us as self-advocates to get in contact with you? Would you prefer an email, a, ma a letter in the regular mail, or a phone call? Well, I have several different methods in which I take constituent calls and, and, and constituent inquiries. First of all, you know, people can email me at my, uh, my, my house email address. People can reach out to me on Facebook. They can call me. They can text me. Whatever works. It, any of those methods are fine. People send me letters. A lot of times what I look to do, though, if I get a message, I try to follow up with a telephone call personally so I can hear about the issue, find out what the, what the concerns are, and where, you know, be able to investigate that issue to see where I might be able to help. So we encourage our self-advocates to do stories about their self-advocacy journeys. Is that something that you encourage? Absolutely. You know, the, the biggest thing is we, we hear about issues on a daily basis. I mean, I get hundreds of emails a week, but if I see something that's got a story, it grabs my attention particularly. I try to respond to all inquiries, but if there's a personal story that I can look and see, okay, Dealing with this issue is going to help somebody get their road paved, or dealing with this issue is going to help somebody re receive their unemployment benefits. Something that is tangible, something that is a personal story, always resonates especially with me, and I think it adds to the, uh, the, the need for us to get back with folks on those issues, and, and it makes me want to be more expeditious in getting back on that claim. So when you get a story from a constituent, does that help when you're out in your committees? Do you read those? How does that work? Absolutely. I mean, when you get, and it's best when it's a personal story, because when you get one of those form emails, you, you don't know where that all came from, and you don't always, you don't handle that the same as you would a personal story or a personal situation. Uh, when I see that, that always impacts how I'm going to vote and how I'm going to try to advocate on the issue, because if I have constituents reaching out to me personally, I know it's important to them, and I want to make sure that I'm on, and I'm representing them as best I can and listening to those concerns fully. And how does that influence the other committee members? What is the impact? Well, I think it always impacts impacts us because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the best thing about the House of Delegates is, is it's the most accountable body in, in, in all of government in West Virginia because we have two-year terms. And at the end of the day, we, we're bound by the will of our constituents. So we have, to, we have to make sure we're listening. We have to make sure we're open to all the concerns on these different issues. And when, they, and when, and when those concerns come through, there's a much better chance that you're going to get the outcome as the person who is seeking the, uh, you know, bringing the concern forward. Okay, what does the WIP do in relation to legislature? Well, the WIPS office plays a vital role in the legislative process. See, on every, every time we bring a bill out for a vote, we never bring that bill out unless we have a pretty firm understanding that we have the consensus of the, of the House to be able to pass the legislation. So the, the purpose of the WIP is basically to go out to hear the feedback from the members, whether or not they want to support a policy or where they're at on the issue, to see if we have the votes to be able to pass the legislation. Since you're the assistant majority whip, how does that work? How does someone become a majority whip? How does that work? Well, in the Republican caucus, we have 78 members, so there's only one whip, so the whip has to have a team to be able to go out and talk to people and find out where everybody's at on a particular issue. And sometimes, if it's a bill that is particularly contentious, say we only have 50 votes or 49 votes, we're trying to get to the consensus to be able to put the bill on the floor, a lot of times we'll go out and we'll say, what would it take to be able to get this done? You know, what would it be? Uh, what is your issue with the bill? Can we make the bill better? And if not, we have to go back to the drawing board. And, uh, you know, the biggest thing for me is I love talking to people. I love working with people and trying to find the middle ground to get things done. So I suppose one of the reasons that I was put in this role is try and use those skills that I've been able to develop to try and move policy forward uh, for the House. What are you passionate about and what are your goals? 
Well, I'm most passionate about really three things in government. That's infrastructure, that's uh, economic development and job creation, and government accountability and transparency, you know, at the infrastructure piece. So I've always said, I've said it a hundred times, if we want people to move to West Virginia, we've got to make sure we have good roads, good bridges, cell service, you know, broadband internet access. Those are important things. Another thing that's important, like I said, is government transparency and accountability. As an auditor by trade, I, I think it's important that we're being good stewards of the dollars, you know, and we've tried to do that. And I think that when government is accountable to the people, that's the way it's supposed to be. And third and finally, with the job creation and, and economic development piece, as somebody who went to college down in the University of Charleston, I'll tell you right now, I, I, I saw all, all of my classmates going different places. They would go to, Cal, they, they want to go to California, they want to go to South Carolina, they want to go to Florida. And when they come to me, they say, where do you want to go after you graduate? I would say, I want to go home. And the only way we're going to do that, the only way we're going to make West Virginia, the place where we want to stay, live, work, and raise our families. I think our biggest job as public officials is to be able, regardless of what level you're at, you're at as far as in the government, is to be able to market West Virginia, make people choose West Virginia as their home and the place where they want to live, work, and raise their families. So those are my priorities. Does your goal in creating jobs, does that include people with disabilities? Absolutely. You know, growing up, my dad uh, taught special education through the public school system for, well, he's actually getting ready, ready to retire this year. And one thing that he always taught me was that, you know, every, every child has, has, every child has value. Every, everybody has, has their skills and their abilities and everybody deserves a fair shake. So yes, I do, I do support that, uh, making sure that we're looking out for folks with disabilities and providing them with the same opportunities as everyone else. Um, how long does it take for an idea to become actual legislation relating t to be a leading sponsor of bills and what is that process? That's a good question. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that we develop legislation. Uh, for me, there are some bills that I introduce that are ideas I personally came up with. Sometimes there are bills that a different organization uh, recommends or wants to take a look at. And sometimes there are bills that a constituent brings up to me. And, you know, the thing is, sometimes, sometimes you can get a bill through in the first year. It's very rare. A lot of times what happens is it takes two and three times to, to build that policy and to refine the policy and to make it better so that it's more more palatable because you know it's a difficult process you know and, and the, to make a law it's supposed to be difficult I mean you got to get you got to get it through the committees in the house pass it on the house floor you got to do the same process in the Senate and then you got to get the governor to get on board with it so you know policy making is, is not easy it's very hard but it just makes it that much more gratifying when you finally get something done uh, for the people you represent do you get everything you want the first go around or does it take several attempts well, a lot of times it takes several attempts. Sometimes it takes piecemealing it together. Together, you know, uh, sometimes you might get one part of a policy, and then next part next year you might get something else done. A great example of that is tax reform. You know, and we've looked at uh, trying to reform the income tax, trying to possibly down the road re reform the uh, business and inventory tax. Those aren't things you can do overnight. Those, there, there's a lot that goes with it, and a lot of times change takes time. And in order to make change happen, you've got to accept accept sometimes incremental reform perfect is there anything else that you'd like to add well I just really appreciate the opportunity to be down here like I say I mean I when I'm not in session I really enjoy the opportunity to get out in the community and not just in Pleasance and Ritchie counties but in the whole Middle High Valley so I appreciate what this organization does and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to join you here this afternoon we have been talking to Trenton Barnhart today, who serves as the Assistant Majority Whip in the West Virginia House of Delegates. Remember, if you ever have any questions, you can reach out to us at the ARC, and we will do our best to help you. You can email me or Morgan directly or call us here at the ARC, 304 422-3151. My direct email is melissa.southhall at peoplefirstwv.org. And I can be reached at morgan.spicer at thearcmov.org. Again, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me.
Now it's time for our Advocate in Action, and today's Advocate in Action is Marina Maddow. Marina lives in Mannington, West Virginia, and is an active member of her People First chapter. She holds a job at the Disability Action Center in Fairmont, where she does a variety of jobs from answering telephones to helping with he healthy cooking, just to name a few. She's also an active runner and has participated in various local marathons. Thank you so much for joining us today, Marina, and welcome to the show. Thank you. All right, let's get this started. First question here. So what kind, um, I, um, when I introduced you, you, you mentioned that I mentioned that you work at the Disability Action Center. So what kind of work do you do there? Could you kind of talk to us about what you do? Well, I am the DAC's program assistant and I keep an eye on the front desk, clean areas. The phone, I also make phone calls and make copies for, for my staff when I don't, when I don't have any caterings. Also, I do feel good meals. As you may know, you guys are going to try our feel good meals tomorrow at the mid year training. I do at least a lot of, I do a lot of baking cookies, prepare boxes, make chicken, steak, pasta salad, and putting pickles in the bags. Also, I am the president of People First of Marion County. Since you know, since our our good old friend Melody Simmons passed away in January, since I had to step up the game in the step up and now I am the president of Marion County. So how did you get the job at the Disability Action Center, Marina? Well, about at least I got my job here about when I did all my service, like when I was in the thing with with MRI, with with my um thing with the DAC, and I became a staff member around Christmas time of 2014. And how long did you volunteer with the Disability Action Center until you decided you wanted to apply for the job? Well, I did at least some DAC stuff for the first um, the first 18 months here. Okay. Excellent. So, what's your favorite part of the job? Do you have anything that you like? Let's see. I like at least keeping an eye on things and helping with the other clients at the DAC. And along with our feel good meals, we started about this. It'll be two years in August. Did you like now you, I, you mentioned that you um, help with the feel good meals. Do you like cooking? Is that something you just got into or is that something that you've ha you've liked for a while? Well, I've been doing it for at least for a while and it's pretty good. <laughs> and it also helps with our community. Yes, I think it's a great thing for the community. Plus, it's a healthy alternative. So, you know, that's a great thing there. Do you have anything favorite you like to cook? Hmm. Mm, I kind of like, I'm mostly cooking for, for myself. Are you better at baking or are you better at making like steaks and stuff? Mm, sometimes I like baking. Hmm. <laughs> Got anything, any favorite things you like to bake? Like, I really like to make them. Um, sometimes I make like birthday cakes for my family for their birthdays once in a while. Oh, wow. And you like watching, do you like watching those cooking shows to get some inspiration? Yes, I've been watching MasterChef. And also, as you may know, MasterChef season starting up in a few, next week. Oh, that's one of my favorite shows. I love MasterChef. Is it future? And is, that, is, is cooking something you'd like to pursue in the future? Is that one of your goals? Mostly to become independent. So just cooking for yourself and not necessarily working on cooking for other people then, right? Uh, that's going to be part of my goal. Oh, okay. Excellent. All right, so... How do you use your self-advocacy skills where you work? Well, I help with, with other self-advocates at work to become more with our self-advocacy area. And become more of a, a role model to others. Now, when you say you're a role model, um, could you kind of explain that? Well, mostly since... I have to make sure since I'm the staff and I have to be a role model to other clients at the Disability Action Center who need help and everything. 
Excellent. So I also hear that you are active in your community as well as your local people first chapter. I've mostly attended to with teleconferences here, mid-year trainings, and every meeting we have of our of our community every month. And how did you get involved with People First? What do you like about People First? Let's see. To, to become more of a self-advocate, and I, as you may know, I joined People First about April of 2014. Wow, that's a lot of time. I've been at it for quite a bit myself. Is this your first title as president? Have you had any other roles in your People First chapter? Well, I've been at least for the secretary for many years, and then until originally I was going to be the vice president, and then I had to step up to be president since one of our good friends passed away. Yeah, and we and we encourage people to get involved in their People First chapter. What what inspired you to want to take that that role on as president of your People First chapter? Well, a lot of people wanted me to become president since I was, I'm going to take a step up to become vice president since I've been at least been secretary for at least for many years. And then it's time to make sure for a change. So I was going to be the vice president. And, the, and then on January 20th of this year, mostly I had to step up. I kind of realized since I was the vice president, president since I have to turn up to become the president. So for anybody watching that's interested in maybe sometime in the future becoming a member of their People First chapter or being an officer, what is some advice you can give them? Why is it good to be an officer? Well, you have to come to many meetings as you can. And also you have to learn at least what learn and also and when when the time in for the election comes and also you come to mostly if you want to nominate and everything to become a president nominating like one an officer now is there any words of encouragement that you could give to anyone that's wanting to step up and take that position mostly if anybody hasn't been coming or mostly who asks, they have to step up. How would you encourage individuals to stand up when they're not? Well, to, well, people first is also to at least speak for yourselves and what we want. And also we, and also we, to have, at least we have an election if you want to run against. But what if people don't want to run? How would you encourage them? Well, if they don't want to run, that's fine. And also, wait about like, like a year or two to do it. Okay, so why is self-advocacy, Marina, so important to you? Well, it, I learned at least a lot during my self-advocacy around here, here, home, and everything. And you talked about living independently. Is that why self-advocacy is so important to you? Yes. Awesome. So is there anything else that you would like to add? Let's see. Also, as you may know, it, my goal is to run 55 counties of West Virginia. Since I got two upcoming races for this year. One, I'm going down to Pocahontas County in a couple of weeks in Cass. The Cass 5K stunt run at the Cass Scenic State Park. And the other race I'm going to do is down in Clay County in Clay in September called the Elk River Rail Trail Half Marathon. So what um, got you into running, wanting to compete in these marathons? What got you into that? Well, mostly I, mostly, mostly I do a lot of races around West Virginia. And also I want to try something new. As you may know, last year, as of last year, I did a total of 10 counties last year. Well, as of so far, my running history. 
Now, is this something you picked up as a hobby or was it something that you got into in high school and participated in track? Mostly as a hobby. And what to you is the benefits of doing all these, the competing what, and running in these marathons? What's the benefit you get from that? Well, mostly running to at least to get some of them have lo is for local charities and fundraisers. They do. And it's also good for your health too, is it? Yes. Yes. And how about what, how about college? Um, are you wanting, are you going to be graduating soon? I, as, as that, I only have five classes left. As you may know, I just finished with a semester and I'm going to be taking next semester off and then I'll be back for college next spring. Since mostly I'm taking a semester off because since none of the classes I have left aren't available. So I'm going to be taking two classes next spring. And have you had to use any of your self-advocacy skills in your college courses? Yes, I've been using a couple of those a couple of a time when I'm at college. If I have like an important trip with you guys, I ask my professor on the first day to make sure or let them know in advance. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And may I ask what it is you are um, go studying for in college? To become a business in, in accounting. Oh, wow. Yeah, when I went to high school and tech school for business. So yeah, that's awesome. So thanks so much for joining us today, Marina. And I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. And bye, guys. Remember, if you want to be featured in a segment of Advocate in Action and are using your self-advocacy skills in a positive light, don't hesitate to reach out to us here at The Arc. You can call The Arc at 304 422 3151, or you can email me or Melissa directly. My email address is morgan.spicer at thearcmov.org, and Melissa can be reached at melissa.southall at peoplefirstwv.org. We would love to hear from you and potentially have you as a future guest on Advocate in Action. I'm afraid that's going to do it for this month's episode of Legislative Matters Now. We want to thank House of Delegates member Trenton Barhart, as well as our Advocate in Action, Marina Maddow, for taking the time to speak with us today. So until next time, remember, advocacy matters, and so do you. See you next time.